Hello, everyone. We're excited for you to be able to tune in today and to talk about something with us that is absolutely a topic that needs to be discussed. I'll, I'll tell you on the front end, this is not an easy topic to discuss, but nevertheless, it's one that the more we discuss it in a healthy, life-giving way, the more healing we can see come to not just the nation, but also ourselves. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the subject of racism. Now, this came to a head, obviously, because like you, we all saw the video this week of George Floyd um, have his life taken from him. And it's still impacting me, and I'm sure it's still impacting you. And we want to discuss how do we talk about this in a way that actually brings progress? How do we move forward in this season? I felt impressed as a pastor. How do I, I pastor myself, my congregation, and you through this season? What is it that we need to know? Um, and what is a path forward? In thinking about how to do this, we decided it would be best to do it in panel format so we could hear from multiple different people and multiple different perspectives, if for no other reason than maybe someone else's perspective can bring new light to this issue for you and can be a part of your healing. Uh, we are blessed here at Word of Life to live out the dream that Martin Luther King Jr. had, where we are made up of every different race here as a staff, as well as every different age group. And that's a blessing because I, I believe it gives us a certain amount of validity. Is that a word, validity? No, it validates. Validity, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, to speak uh, on this issue. Um, and we're just gonna dive in. So I'll introduce the, the panel to you. Uh, we'll start on this side. We have Miss Myria, uh, who is over human resources here. Uh, at Word of Life, she does uh, hiring, firing, coaching, <laughs> correcting. She is absolutely God's best, and we're excited to have her. We have Brian uh, Butler, who is just uh, an amazing young man, filled with God's spirit and anointing, and just one of my favorite people. We have Robert Berry Jr., uh, who is one of my closest friends, a confidant, an advisor, a counselor. He's an associate pastor here at Word of Life and just a tremendous friend and asset to this ministry and myself. We have Luke Spencer, uh, who's an associate pastor here at Word of Life, who is just a dream of a human, loves humanity. You can't take him anywhere without him praying for somebody or witnessing to somebody. Just uh, a wonderful human. And we have Hillary Ravick. Uh, who is the sheer definition of joy and enthusiasm. And uh, she does so much with our media and our online campus and fleshing and developing that out and just is a, a dream of a human. All of us have different backgrounds. We all grew up in different homes. We all saw different sites. Uh, we have all experienced different things and we want to share those experiences. Uh, we wanna start with asking this question. Um, to ourselves, to each other, and also to you. Is racism still in America? Because you can't deal with something until you know it's there. But if you know it's there, then we can begin to confront it and deal with it and get it out. And so there unfortunately is, is I feel like a segment of America that does not believe that there is still racism. Um, but I have seen that it is, and I have had conversations with people who have seen that it is. And so I just, I want to throw that out there to our panel. Um, is racism a thing? If so, has it impacted you? Have you seen it? Have you felt awkward because of your race? Have you felt different because of your race? And if so, what has that looked like for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of jump in there. Um, so 
my background kind of uh, is, is interesting in this conversation. Um, but so my mom's white, my dad's black. Um, and through that, they uh, came into a marriage and a relationship uh, that was in a season where, um, where there was a lot of maybe like demonstrated racism, uh, like very open about what people thought, very open about their feelings, very open about their perspective on my parents' relationship and how it was wrong. Um, and so for me, uh, being a kid that grew up in a space where um, I didn't meet a lot of mixed kids. <laughs> I didn't meet a lot of kids that were multiple races. Um, I met a, a lot of kids when I grew up in the different places, the schools and the cities we lived in. Uh, it was like there was black kids and there was white kids. Uh, and so for me, um, I think that it definitely uh, had this, uh, yeah, I experienced racism. Um, and that's like kind of tough to say in, in one sense, uh, maybe in all senses, um, but not being able to, uh, to identify with someone in my experience of racism, I think was maybe the more challenging part. Um, that for certain spaces, I, uh, I had a black dad, so I couldn't, I couldn't be white, <laughs> but I had a white mom, so I couldn't really be, be black either. And, and for me, um, to still experience, uh, the, um, the weight of being a black man in America while not being always identified as a black man was just strange. Uh, or the weight of being a white man in America, but not really ever being identified as a white man in America um, was and is a process uh, that I think I still walk through, I'm still figuring it out, I'm still trying to understand. Um, but in my, my experience, um, I have definitely, uh, experience racism in, in many ways. Um, so yeah. I, like Brian, come from a multiracial, multicultural home. My dad is white, he's Jewish, my mom is black. And I have all these siblings who are half siblings. So we've all kind of walked a different path when it comes to our identity as people of color. And I do believe that there is racism today. I don't think it's gone away. I think it looks very different from how it looked perhaps in the 50s and 60s and before. Um, and in some cases it looks the same, which is shocking. Um, but being a woman of color, my experience with racism has been so different, I think, to being mixed race, a lot of people don't know what my background is, so they don't know how to speak to me, or I've unfortunately faced a lot of microaggressions. Like people don't know that I have black family, so they'll say comments thinking that they're in the clear or that it's okay, it's a safe space because a black person may not be present and I have to speak on behalf of an entire people um, who may not always speak for me. So it has been very different in these times, you know, being mixed race, being a woman of color. Um, but yeah, I do think racism exists now. I think that's why we're having this conversation. <laughs> but yeah. For me, um, I've experienced um, racism during a time before you were born, probably. Um, I remember, um, as a nine-year-old, my family moved to an entire white neighborhood. Before then, we were, of course, that was during a time when there was segregation. And when integration occurred, my family decided to move into an all-white neighborhood. And that was really the first time that I felt different. And um, the day that we moved in to our new home, I remember a guy from a house over from us, one door over, standing on the porch or sitting on a porch with a rifle. But I also remember the lady walking down the street, welcoming us um, with cake for our family. 
And through that experience, I got to realize that there will be people that will not accept me. And then there will be people that will embrace me. And from that point on, I was on a journey on learning who those people were. And even to this day, I am still on that journey of knowing who those people are who will accept me and who will reject me. And I think too that um, as we continue on this journey and the thing that I've learned most about this is that it is important how I respond. And, and, and even people that I encounter, it's important how you respond. And I've always found that the way to respond to particularly racism is from a place of love. And that may sound like, well, that's kind of a, kind of a wimpy way to respond, but it is not. I have found that when you respond from a place of love, then you can embrace others and um, that are different from you. And you can also navigate through when people don't accept you because I believe that love in this is a conqueror of that. And I have found that to be the case. Yeah, now I think that that's just a profound point that you made is it's easy to hate. It's, it's just, it's a easy place to fall over into hatred, but it takes tremendous amount of strength to love an enemy. Like love is not the weak way. It is always the strongest way to turn the other cheek and to be Christ-like in a moment. And I think that that's um, such a powerful response. I, I want people to understand the breadth of what she said of moving into a neighborhood and ha having someone greet you with a, a gun on their front porch versus someone greeting you with a cake. And if nothing else, I would ask you, how have you greeted your neighbors? How have you looked at them when they're walking down the sidewalk? How did you treat them when they moved in? And maybe it has been a place of indifference, maybe even, but what if we did make cakes? What if we did bake cookies or just go and introduce ourselves? Like how could we be a source of peace even in our neighborhoods that way? Uh, this week, I had a conversation with a gentleman who is around my same age and has children um, my same age, but the difference is, is he has a different color of skin. I'm white. He's black. He also pastors here in the community. And we were talking about these issues and how we can lead our congregation through these issues. And we were talking about the situation a, a week or two ago of Ahmed Aubrey and just talking about the impact that that had. And he mentioned to him something I never considered of like immediately it sparked him to want to have a meeting with the neighborhood association because he runs in his neighborhood and his children run in the neighborhood and he wanted to make sure that they would be okay. And when he said that, like my son, Boston, he's in soccer and every day he runs around the neighborhood for training. He'll run about a mile and a half for training. And I've never had to wonder, like, was he okay running around the neighborhood, like it, it wouldn't have crossed my mind to think like I need to meet with my neighborhood association to make sure that he's okay or I'm okay to do that. And he wanted to ask the neighborhood association, like what is the response if we see someone that we believe may be suspicious? What do we do in that situation? Uh, like is the neighborhood trained to call the police versus try to take these matters into their own hands. And I think even conversations like that need to be happening uh, across America. And is that a tough conversation to have? Yes, but can it help stop situations like that from happening? Yes. And so that's the whole point of this is to have that tough conversation too, even in the church world. 
And I, I mentioned that to our panel before they came out. And I want you to know, like, that's a reality for several people on the panel. People that you see do announcements, people that you see serve you every time you come to the church. And Robert, if you wouldn't mind like sharing like how that impacts you as a, a black man, like how that impacts you hearing something like what happened to Mr. Aubrey, how do you process that before and after? How did you feel? Well, of, of course, um, before, cause I run and I enjoy running in the neighborhood, uh, even getting on different trails to run. And so, um, after seeing that video, of course, you know, there's a, there's a shock, there's a shock, there's a shock that comes to me because I'm like, I'm no different than him. I'm just in a different state. And I, I just want to run because I have the motto that I don't ever want it to be a time that where my children and my grandchildren want to play with me. And they have to pull me off the couch that where I'm not in a healthy state. So that is my vision why I run. And as I see this, this man run, young man run, and I'm like, are you serious? What, what just happened? What just occurred? It's like, why? And for me, it's now when I, when I run, I run. I run with my cell phone because I don't know now because even as I get my clothes on to run, I have that video in my head. And sometimes I wonder if I go, if, if I go out running is that my last time running? And so now I, I run with my cell phone because it's like, hey, if it does, am I thankful for God for protection and angels? Yes. But it's like just, just that impact because I'm not bothering anyone. I, I just want to be healthy so I can live a long life and spend time with my children and my grandchildren. That's all I want to do. And, you know, when, when it comes to that of, of racism, that is something that, you know, just even in, in my life that I've experienced, you know, after seeing that video and, you know, like uh, even before then, it could be just, you know, pulling up to the gas station. It, it could be going into a grocery store, uh, you know, like even on vacation, just the way I'm greeted, just the way I'm treated. Uh, the way I, I get a hello, a greeting, and I just remind myself that even in the midst of this, I still have to make sure that I respond in the way of love, that I still respond in the way that I desire uh, to be responded to as well as to be treated. And uh, it's great even for us and like having conversations like this because uh, it allows us not only just to have the conversations, but also too, there's a healing that come because we realize that we're not the only ones that are experiencing it as in, you may not experience it as like it being a, a black person, but you can experience it as in like, man, that should not have happened. That should not have occurred. And um, in having conversations like this, healing does takes place as well. Now, there's a quote that I've been meditating on, and it was by Benjamin Franklin. I saw several people post it this week, and they said, justice will not be served until those unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And when it's somebody random that you don't know who you think may be the victim of something, it's like a certain level of, of outrage or maybe anger may may arise but when you you talk to people who you love and you know and you see and you, you you do church with and ministry with 
that this is a reality that they live with, that it, it sparks a level in us of outrage to el- at least begin to aggressively combat this in our own lives. And somebody said, what is the goal of this? The goal of this is for you to have these conversations in your own family about if someone of another race moves into your neighborhood, how do you go about making sure that that person knows that they are loved, valued, and honored as the child of God that they are? And it sparks a conversation now to bring them an extra measure of peace. And if that's all that this did was make someone in your neighborhood feel more comfortable about running in that neighborhood, then it is well worth our time to have this panel. But it begins with these types of conversation, conversations. Racism, it is most definitely an issue that has been in this nation since its inception. And we must all do our part, no matter how big or small that part may be, to blot that spirit of racism out of our nation and to bring healing to those who have been affected by it. And that's where I want to take our conversation today is what do you all see as panelists and as people who love each other and also love the Lord as the Christian response to racism where we can begin to take this forward and see healing come to our hearts in this season? Because I have talked to so many people throughout this process who need healing in their hearts right now. What can we say to them that can bring healing there? But also what can we say to bring healing to our nation and be a solution to ending racism in our time? We, we talked about this before and we said how one of the biggest things we can do is hold conversation. And I know that everyone's saying it and it seems so obvious or may not seem like the most active thing that we can do, but it has helped tremendously. Even in the conversation we had before this, knowing that the people that I work with every day um, see injustice and not only see it, but they speak out about it or will go out of their way to ask the questions to further understand what is happening in our nation, in our streets, in our neighborhoods has given me so much hope for the future that when I have kids one day, the future that they will have. Because this whole time I'm seeing all these people being persecuted who look like what my children are going to look like. And I'm thinking even now, like, how do I have that conversation? When do I have that conversation? And I'm sure, Rob, like, as a parent with Chase and Kyla, like, you're, you're probably thinking that too. Like, what does that conversation look like without instilling fear? Because you don't want to be fearful. I never want to live my life afraid of my neighbor, of my coworker. So I would encourage people who are wondering, what do I do? whether you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, mixed race, a little bit of everything, start having the conversation. Don't be too timid to ask a question. And if you're the one being asked, don't don't be so closed off as to not answer. And it's okay if you're in a moment where it's too soon or it's too fresh to answer. I think we need to have understanding for that as well, but conversation is two-way, communication is two ways, and we have to be willing to answer the questions when they are asked, you know, however often or seldom it may be. Yeah, that's good. Um, Meyer, talk about, like, when your parents, because that's one of the things, I was thinking about this even when you were talking, of, like, how all of us, at least I think, had parents who were very intentional about exposing us to other cultures, to other people, that now we all worship at a church that is made up of people of all different races and backgrounds and all those types of things, that I think that that's a big part of it uh, as well, is like, that's a part of that, of like being around other races and people to have conversations and have these things. But how do you go about doing that? Like, Meyer, how did your parents go about, like, choosing integration, choosing 
to, I can't imagine what that would be like to move into an all white neighborhood and to look out as a father and mother and see a neighbor hold a shotgun in front of my daughter. Like, I can't imagine what is going through their mind in that, that season and that hour. How did your parents go about integrating you into a place where you could begin having fellowship with people of other races and, and not being intimidated or tearing down those walls? When I look back during that time, the thing that I remember about my parents was that they talked to me a whole lot. They, they helped me with those feelings that I had when I was looked at in a different way. In fact, the, the day that we moved in, I was so naive in that there were um, men in our old neighborhood that would sit on their porch with a, a rifle, but they were going hunting. And so when I first saw that, I thought, well, it's kind of late for him to go hunting. And so I mentioned that to my dad, and he just said he's not going hunting and, and had me go inside. And, and then they started to have conversations with me about how to respond they, so that it wouldn't be shocking when um, I was called names. I knew how to respond. I also knew, too, from the people at my church, the Sunday school teachers, my pastor, all of those people, how to respond. And that response always came from a place of love. And I, I guess that's just the place that, that I was, I, I was kind of settled in with this, is that no matter how hard it got, and I, I can tell you that it was not always easy. In fact, I, I can't think of an easy situation during that time. But then there were times where I just had to, even when I spoke up, had to do so from a place that didn't affect my heart. I remember there was a situation where it did impact my heart and I was mad. And my dad, I remember us sitting on the porch and he saying, you can't, he said, you can't live life that way with that in your heart. I wanted, well, I wanted the rule for our house not to have any white people because there was a rule in one of my friend's house that black people couldn't come into their home. And so the conversation with me was that this is not, this is not the rule in our house. And, um, and if you go through life like that, you will end up being more hurt than the person that you're trying to guard yourself from. Mm -hmm. And so that, and he said, that will never be a rule in our house. And, um, and then my dad said something that was that, that I always remember about that situation. And he said, now just remember this about your friend is that she doesn't make the rules in her house, just like you can't make the rules in this house. So still embrace her because she's only living by the rules that's in her house, just like you are. And so we continued to play even though you know, I only went to her porch, but she could come in our house. And I'm glad I was at an age to where I could do that. I was still growing and still being developed. So all of that is part of, I guess, me growing up in this situation. That's so good. Um, what, having a conversation, I think that's a great place to start. Um, not writing off somebody just because their parents had a set of values that may not be representative of them and classifying or stereotyping as all white people is that way. And, you know, I think stereotyping is a big part of how racism develops, but giving white people a chance, giving her another chance, I think is so huge because I can't imagine, I can, well, I can imagine the temptation to say like, okay, you have that rule in your house. I'm going to implement that rule in my house and we're going to be just as anti-white as you are anti-black, that that would be the easy thing to do. But to come back with, with love 
and to open yourself back up to that friendship. How do you go about doing that? How do you go about doing that? Have y'all, I'm sure all of y'all have had situations like that. How do you, how do you go through that process of like loving and opening your heart back up, knowing that the answer is not more racism and the answer is not to answer back with the same answer they gave us, but to answer with a heart of love, knowing that that's the cure for this. Like, how do you go about doing that? I think it really goes back to what Myra said in the beginning is love, obviously. But I know for me, uh, there's a lot of things I do before I leave my house. Not every single day, but a lot of days. And, and one of the things, it's become, I guess, a habit or just kind of just, you just do it naturally. But for a long time, I just be like, you know what? I'm, I'm determined today that I'm going to go out and I'm going to love people no matter how I'm treated, no matter how people come at me or whatever in traffic or whatever it may be. But, but one of the things that I had determined to do is to make sure I'm listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling me on the inside. No matter what I see, no matter what this video is making me feel in this moment, because I'll watch those videos too. And man, it produced some serious or like just so much anger and so much rage, but that's its goal, right? But if you can take that and say, okay, Holy Spirit, what do I do with this? Lead me, help me, you know, channel this almost um, into uh, a solution. And so I watch that and I'm like, man, it just fuels my fire to want to go out and be the best representative of Jesus, loving unconditionally that I can possibly be to everybody and not see, you know, this person's white or this person's black or whatever. It's not about that. It's about loving humanity, period. That's what Jesus did. And he's like our best example of everything. If we can just go out and see a human race. And not necessarily, yes, there are different races and we, that's awesome. Cultures are amazing. We want to embrace that, but there is one human race. And that's how I try to see that. Not that I don't want to see all their different races, but it's like, I want to see a human race and I want to love unconditionally, not based on anything other than what Jesus is telling me in that moment. Because honestly, the main reason I do that is because I want to be effective at what Jesus has called me to do. And he's called me to love and to represent him well. I cannot do that if I'm looking at people and judging people or being critical of them for any reason whatsoever, whether it's color or not. I can't be effective at what he's called me to do. And need, any none of us can be. If we're going to look at somebody and judge them, you just lost your effectiveness in their life. And I don't know where that person's at. That person needs, maybe need help. I know everybody needs help, right? But it's like, I can't be effective at what he's called me to do if I'm going to judge that person for any reason whatever, whatsoever. But it starts with determining, I think, in your heart before you leave your house. And I know it's a big statement for some. Me, maybe not as much as others, whatever that looks like. But being like, no, today I'm determined to love. I'm going to be an ambassador for love, you know, whatever that looks like. Yeah, I think I think of um, the scripture in the Bible uh, when it's talking about David, um, when he and his men had just been at war and they came back and their city was burned, uh, their families were gone, taken. Um, and there's this moment where everyone grieved. Uh, and, I, and I think that that in us being a part of the solution, looking towards how do we, how do we move uh, forward from this? I think it's giving people a space to grieve yeah. and to not judge their grieving. Yeah, that's good. Um, that, that for David and his men, it says that they wept until there was no more tears left. Uh, and, and I know that there's people that are feeling that right now in this moment of like, what in the world is going on? Um, and, and I think it's so interesting that what, what the men did is they got angry. They got frustrated. They were yeah. like, man, we're going we're gonna to do something about this. Uh, and, and I think that that is, is a very typical response of whenever we are faced with racism. It's like, I'm angry, this is wrong. They've taken something from me. They've done something to me. They've burned my cities. They've killed my people. Like I'm going to do something, but I find it so interesting that the leader. So good, Brian. That David, he steps into a place and says, no, I'm in this pain with you, yeah. but I'm choosing a different response. And his response was to seek the Lord. 
and to say, shall I pursue? And you've preached on this many times, but like the fact that he asked, shall I pursue? And not just God, give me victory. Like the fact that he had the question, like the humility to say, God, I feel all of this. And I'm going to bring all of this to you and trust that you're big enough to handle this. That's good, bro. And I'm going to say, God, shall I pursue? I think that there's a, a lot of people that are, are wrestling with this, but maybe feel as if God has abandoned them in this, that he doesn't see it, that, that he's not affected by it, that he, he's not hurt by racism. Because if he was, he would fix it. I think it's a moment for us as believers. If we aren't believers, then this is a completely different conversation. But the fact that we do have a God that, that, is, that is bigger than racism, that is the solution to racism, I think that as a church, what, what unity looks like in this season for us, what moving forward in this season for us, it looks like coming to God and saying, shall we pursue? Because he'll show us exactly what to do, how to do it, where to go, where not to go, the conversations to have, the conversations to not have. And I think it's trusting God in that moment of like, if we, if we, get, if we are going to say that we're believers, that we're Christians, there must be something that separates us. Yeah. And it is the God factor. Uh, so I think that's, for me, that's, that's the perspective that I kind of have on it. That's good, Brian. Now, I, I think that story when you were talking about it, I can't think of a better one for this season. And like you said, to have the courage to, I think this is a big, big part of all this too, to mourn with those who mourn. And I saw like this subtle form of racism that cropped up even while people are watching the video, they begin to blame shift. Of like, why are y'all making such a big deal about this? You know, 50 people in Chicago died this weekend. Well, what about the girl in the video who's filming? Like, if I was her, I would have jumped in. And making it about everything else other than the victim in this video. And to come in and identify with that victim and to mourn with his family in that community and to say... Yes, there are plenty of other issues in the world, but this is the one we're focusing on. This is the one that needs to be addressed right now. This is the one that is causing pain, like to focus on this, because when I blame shift, I focus on things that I can't control. But when I, I look at that image and I allow it to impact me, it makes me say, like, I have to speak up about this. Like, I have to mourn with those who mourn and come in collectively as, as every race, not just white or black, but Hispanic and Asian and Latino and everything else. And to say like, this is not okay. And this is the issue that collectively we will focus on until it is eradicated and, and to come in and see what, what we can do. And I, I think we're at this place now where we have to understand that we are each other's brother's keeper that I will not make his blood cry out for him like Cain did Abel's, but we will cry out for each other and that we will cry out for Robert and Robert will cry out for me and I will cry out for Brian and Brian will cry out for Myria and I will cry out for Ahmad Aubrey and we will cry out collectively as a group for all of these individuals who have had their lives taken from them and to not shift the issue onto another one that's more convenient for us to point blame at someone else, but to each one of us decide that we will take this issue into our own hands and lift up our voices. I, I think let's not blame shift. Let's each lift up our voice. Let's weep with those who weep. Let's encourage ourselves in the Lord in this season and get direction to move forward with his advance. Let's be open to give each other all another chance, knowing that hatred only produces a root of bitterness in us that will defile us and defile our children and ultimately defile this nation. But if we can open up to the heart of love, it will begin to begin the ending to all of these things that once had a start.
What else do you guys see? You know, as we kind of wrap up and close up, what, what do what do you guys want to end with? What do you what do you want to say to people who are hurting? What do you want to say to people who want answers? What, what do you want to say to our church? You know, as I was um, talking to the Lord about some of these things this past week, um, I happened to pass by this picture of my um, great grandfather, and um, he was born in the 1800s. And in that picture, I see my grandmother as a nine-year-old, and, and it just suddenly dawned on me that my life looked a whole lot different than theirs. And um, they were a family, and I can tell by the picture that, they, that there was much love in that family, even during that time. And so I began to remember that, Lord, I so thank you that you brought us from that place to where you brought us in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And even to where you brought us now is not perfect. And man's heart is still, some hearts are still very dark. But Lord, I thank you for what you've done. So I know that you will also see us come through this. And that gave me hope in this, that I know what I see right now, but I know what I've seen and I know what I've heard just from the stories that were passed down from the people in that picture. So good. I know uh, just uh, thinking about the example with uh, Jesus uh, and the disciples, uh, of course, how he was saying that he must need go through Samaria. And in this moment, uh, the disciples are telling him, now, Jesus, you know, good and well, you know, good and well. We don't have communications with the Samaritans. But Jesus said, I must need go through Samaria. He knew he needed to get to Samaria because he knew with him getting to Samaria, he was going to get to a lady. And in getting to that lady, she was going to get to a city. And out of her getting to that city, it changed everything. Not only just for her, but for the city. And even in the midst of what has happened, I realize for me as a husband, as well as a father, I must need go through my street, through our neighborhood, and still be the example for my wife and for our children, Chase and Kyla, that we're, they're still playing with those same friends that are of different color. That even when I pull up to the house, all of their bikes, the neighbor's bikes are in the driveway and I have to wait till they move their bikes so I can pull up <laughs> in the driveway. And Kim is like, whoo, I'm so glad you're here. I can take a break now. And she goes inside and I'm outside seeing them playing with their neighbors, different races, and they're having so much fun. And I just want to encourage you as well as I'm even encouraging my family and leading by example that even in the midst of racism still going on, we must need go through our neighborhood, our Samaria, and make sure we are being the example for our families, for our children, and even our neighbors. And it's so interesting. It's one of the young ladies, kid y'all not, kid y'all not. So uh, getting here to work like at eight o'clock, I leave like at 7.45. I'm going to the car. She's standing in the doorway. Hey, how you doing? I was like, hey. Next thing I know, my wife texts me in about 10 minutes. Hey, she's ringing the doorbell. She's ready to play with Chase and Kyla. I'm like, <laughs> 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 yes. And so I just want to encourage y'all that even in the midst of this, that, hey, just as Jesus did, just as Jesus had the conversation with the disciples and he led by example, he went through Samaria the city was changed. So as we go through our Samaria, we will see things change. Well, and even, you know, through our conversations, both with your father, who's a member of our church, he went through Samaria. And the impact that that has had in you and the impact that that's now having in your children. And for each one of us to be willing to go through Samaria from our churches, to your birthday parties, to who you invite to lunch.
to the people you listen to. For you to make sure no matter what your dealings with the Sumerians may be in the past, that for the sake of our nation and for the sake of our children and our children's children's and George Floyd's and Philando Castile's, Eric Gardner's, that each one of us make a decision to go through our Samarias. We love you so much, Word of Life. We speak healing into you. We speak victory into you. We speak peace into you. We speak life into you. We speak victory into you. You are dearly loved. Dearly loved. Myra, would you would you pray for our church in this season and just pray for Father God, I thank you so much for your mercy. And Father, as I think about your mercy, that it is new every day, it's because we need it every day. And Father, I thank you that with your hand of mercy, Father, upon our nation, upon our culture, Father, I know that we will walk in the direction that you would have us to walk in as, as your creation. Father, you created us all in your image. And you were intentional in making us different in the way we look and the way we, and even in some of our accents, Father, it's, it's by your divine hand that you created us that way because that's what makes us all beautiful in your image. And so, Father, with that, we know that even in the things that's happening right now that is so not like you, that you, your hand is upon our nation and that your voice is still speaking loud and that as your people, we will, Father, speak to those things the way you see them. So Father, I thank you that even as Word of Life Church, a church that you are making as an example in this, Father, that we will show that many cultures can live under one roof in harmony and be the image of you. And Father, I speak that over our church, that as we have many cultures here, that we will still show your image in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Hillary, would you pray specifically over your generation? Because I, I know that, especially in the age of social media, all these things are being processed in a way that's so unique to your generation and to the generation below you. And it impacts us in different ways. And would you just speak a prayer over your generation and your hope and your dream for that generation? And just pray that out. Father, I just thank you for meeting us here, Lord. I thank you for the realization that you exist outside of this time and that you have a plan for growth and for peace and for harmony for all of your children no matter what nation they come from, Lord. And I pray that in this time of mourning, um, in this time of confusion and hurt, that your light will shine through. Lord, that the, the people that you have called to speak out, the people that you have destined to, to shift culture will open their eyes, will, will open their mouths and begin this process, Lord. 
And Father, I know it's not going to be easy for those people, but I pray that your supernatural peace, your favor is upon those people, Lord. God, I pray that those who are under the sound of this prayer right now, those whose, whose hearts are quickening to the thought of speaking out and, and representing people of all cultures, Lord, God, I pray that they will take this moment to pick up that mantle. And I pray that they realize that they're not carrying it alone, that they are not, it's not a responsibility that is just on them. Um, and that they will be able to do the miraculous things that you have destined for them through, with you and, and through you by your hand, Lord. God, I pray that there is a realization that voices are being heard. The cries and the prayers of the saints who've gone before us are being heard and they are being answered. And I just pray for your continual move, your continual grace upon this generation, in this nation, and the generations to come, Lord. Have your way in your name. We pray. Amen. Amen. We love your word of life. We'll see you next week.